you are faced with a game involving three doors. Behind one door is a brand new car, and behind the other two are goats. The host, Monty Hall, asks you to choose a door. You pick door one. Next, Monty opens door two, revealing one of the goats. He offers you the option to switch to door three or remain with your chosen door. What should you do? The vast majority of people choose to stay for purely psychological reasons. Those who attempt a logical response conclude it doesn't matter, it's a 50-50 choice. After all, there are exactly two doors and we have no information about which has a car behind it. Or do we? In fact, the optimal strategy is to switch, doubling your odds of winning. This is the Monty Hall Paradox. Despite being a solved problem, its solution widely accepted and mathematically proven, it remains a source of confusion, disbelief and even outrage. The typical explanations tend to only confuse the skeptic further. In this video, I'm going to explain why that is. History The Monty Hall paradox gets its name from Monty Hall, the host of the 1960s game show Let's Make a Deal. Contestants would choose one of three doors, knowing a big prize was behind one while the other two hit smaller prizes, or sometimes goats. The original game wasn't set in stone. Monty would occasionally offer cash instead of the option to switch, or his decisions might be influenced by what made for better TV. Fast forward to 1990, when Marilyn Vos Savant introduced a simplified version of the scenario in her Ask Marilyn column. In her version, Monty always reveals a goat and always gives the player the chance to switch. The surprising result? Switching doubles your odds of winning, boosting them from one-third to two-thirds. That's when the real controversy started. Professors, mathematicians and skeptics flooded Vos Savant with letters, insisting she was wrong. Some refused to believe it, even when the math clearly showed otherwise. At its heart, the Monty Hall problem is a clash between intuition and logic. When we first hear the setup, it's easy to get caught up in the story, wondering things like, is Monty trying to trick me or can I really trust him? These are natural thoughts, but they miss the mark. The math behind the problem doesn't care about Monty's intentions or whether you're suspicious of him. It's all about simplifying the scenario to focus purely on probabilities. Stripping away the human element lets us see the numbers for what they are and find a clear answer. In real life, it might make sense to ask those psychological questions. But with this paradox, solving the abstract problem gives you the solution. You just have to trust the math. To do that, you need to understand the game's strict rules. One. There are three doors. One hides a car, and the other two hide goats. Two, you pick a door. Three, Monty opens a different door revealing a goat. Four, you're given the option to switch to the remaining closed door. In this version, Monty is essentially a robot. To make it even clearer, we could add a rule 3.1 if Monty can choose between two goats, he always picks the lower numbered door or flips a coin. It doesn't affect the probabilities, it just removes any uncertainty about his actions. In the example we started with, rule 3 wasn't spelled out explicitly, but the critical piece is that Monty knows where the car is and always opens a door with a goat that isn't yours. That's the key to why switching is the better move. You just have to accept these rules to fully understand why the math works. Let's talk about Marilyn Vos Savant's 100 Doors 99 Goats explanation. It's a clever way to make the Monty Hall problem easier to understand by exaggerating the setup. By scaling up the scenario, the logic behind switching becomes more obvious. Or at least, that's the idea. Here's how it works. Imagine you're faced with 100 doors. Behind one of them is a brand new car, and behind the other, 99 are goats. Monty Hall asks you to pick a door, and you go with door one. 
Now, Monty begins opening the other doors one by one, revealing goats behind each. He starts with door 2 and continues all the way to door 100, except for one curious exception. He skips over door 29. So now, there are two unopened door. Door 1, your original pick, and door 29, the one Monty intentionally left closed. Monty offers you the chance to switch to door 29. What should you do? At this point, most people lean towards switching, leaving one specific door out right of the 99 he opens seem deliberate, and intuitively, it feels like door 29 must be the better choice. And they'd be right. Switching is the better move, because the odds of winning shift dramatically in your favor. But why? When you picked door 1, there was only a 1 in 100 chance that you chose the car, and a 99 out of 100 chance that the car was behind one of the other doors. Monty's actions don't change those initial odds, they just redistribute the 99 out of 100 probability across the remaining unopened doors. By the time Monty reveals goats behind all but one of those doors, all of that probability condenses onto the single unopened door, door 29. Switching gives you a 99% chance of winning the car compared to just 1% if you stick with your original choice. But there's a big catch. This explanation, while powerful, isn't perfect. It relies on abstract thinking and the ability to generalize insights from one scenario to another. Scaling up to 100 doors makes the average of switching feel obvious in this context, but it requires a mental leap to apply the same logic back to the original three-door problem. Here's why. In the 100-door example, the scale is so exaggerated that it's easy to focus on the specific numbers and the unusual setup. You're looking at 99 doors being eliminated, which makes door 29 stand out as the obvious choice. But the principle that's actually at play, how probabilities redistribute after Monty reveals the goats, applies just as much to the three-door version. The challenge is helping people see that the math doesn't change, no matter how many doors you start with. Without making this connection clear, the 100 doors, 99 goats explanation can feel disconnected or even confusing. People might see it as an entirely different problem rather than an exaggerated version of the same one. To fully understand the Monty Hall paradox, it's important to focus not on the size of the setup, but on how Monty's actions shift the odds in both scenarios. That's the key to why switching works. Another way to explain the Monty Hall problem is by breaking it down step by step through all possible scenarios. This method, called exhaustive search, lays out every possible outcome to make the solution crystal clear. When you chart out all the possibilities, a clear pattern emerges. In one of three of the scenarios, staying wins, which happens when you correctly pick the car on your first try. In two out of three of the scenarios, switching wins because the car is behind one of the doors you didn't initially choose. This table is about as straightforward as it gets. It leaves no room for debate. Switching is the better option. Yet even with all the possibilities laid out like this, some people remain unconvinced. Here's why. While the table proves that switching works, it doesn't address the lingering intuition that once Monty reveals a goat, the odds should split evenly 50-50 between the two remaining doors. People get stuck on the idea that Monty's reveal somehow resets the game, even though the math says otherwise. The exhaustive search shows the outcome but doesn't dig into why this counterintuitive result happens. That missing explanation can leave skeptics feeling like they're still missing a piece of the puzzle. Another way to understand the Monty Hall paradox is to think of it as a choice between your first pick and all the other options combined. This perspective emphasizes that switching effectively gives you access to combining probability of the unchosen doors. 
It simplifies the math and makes it clear why switching is the better choice. After you make your choice, Monty opens one of the other doors to reveal a goat. This action doesn't change the original probability of your first pick. The door you chose still has a 1 in 3 chance of hiding the car. The 2 in 3 probability that the car is behind one of the other two doors doesn't vanish. Instead, Monty's reveal transfers all that probability onto the one unopened door. If you decide to switch from the start, it's like saying, I'm betting the car is behind one of the other two doors, not my first pick. Since Monty always reveals a goat from the pair, your switching strategy lets you inherit the combined odds of both unchosen doors, two out of three, after his reveal. This is why switching is the better choice. It's not about sticking with one door or picking another at random, it's about using Monty's reveal to take advantage of the better odds tied to the unchosen doors. But this explanation can feel counterintuitive. People tend to view the doors as separate individual options rather than as groups. The idea that switching gives you the benefit of both unchosen doors can seem tricky or misleading. After all, only one door remains unopened. How can it represent the combined chances of two doors? That's where the disconnect happens, making it harder for skeptics to see the logic behind the strategy. The favorite explanation among statisticians is the Bayesian approach, which meticulously accounts for every detail. To follow this reasoning, you need to understand, or at least accept, that probabilities must be updated based on new information, and the correct way to do this is by applying Bayes' rule. The right-hand side of Bayes' rule represents the probability of A given B. In simpler terms, B is something we already know or just learned to be true. For example, let's say we picked door 1 and Monty revealed a goat behind door 3. Now we want to calculate the probability that the car is behind door 2, given that Monty showed us a goat behind door 3. To do this, we apply Bayes' rule. But first, we need three probabilities that make up the right-hand side of the equation. First, the calculation. How do we arrive at the solution? Let me break it down step by step. First off, the probability that Monty opens door 3, given the car is behind door 2, is 1. In this case, Monty has no choice. If the car is behind door 2, he must reveal the goat behind door 3. Secondly, the probability that the car is behind door 2, unconditional on anything, is 1 in 3. This is the prior probability representing the chance of guessing the correct door at the start. And lastly, the probability that Monty opens door 3 without knowing the car's location is 1 in 2. We imagine that Monty doesn't know where the car is, he has a 50% chance of opening either door 3 or door 2. Now, plugging these probabilities into Bayes' rule gives us the answer. The car has a 2 in 3 probability of being behind the door we didn't choose. In other words, switching is the better strategy. You might wonder if the same logic applies to your original choice, door 1. It doesn't. While the second two probabilities remain the same, the first one, the probability that Monty opens door 3, given the car is behind door 1, is different, which is why the math leads to a different result. The probability that Monty opens door 3, given the car is behind door 1, is not 1. In this situation, Monty has a choice. He can open either door 2 or door 3. This means the probability of him opening door 3 is 1 in 2. Plugging this into the calculation confirms the car has a 1 in 3 chance of being behind your original choice. To truly understand this, it helps to walk through the process step by step at your own pace. Redoing the calculations yourself can make the logic much clearer. If you do, you'll see for yourself how the numbers consistently reveal why switching gives you better odds.
The difficulty with the Monty Hall paradox isn't in understanding the math, it's in confronting how we naturally think. It forces us to question and override deeply rooted intuitions about fairness, randomness and probability. When Monty reveals a goat, most people instinctively believe the remaining two options must be equally likely. This feels fair because it aligns with our sense of symmetry. Two doors left, one car, so it's a 50-50 chance. But the paradox challenges this intuition by revealing a deeper truth. Probabilities aren't static. They can change based on new information even when the physical setup remains unchanged. What makes this even harder to accept is that this shift in probabilities isn't immediately visible. Monty's reveal doesn't feel like it should affect the odds because he isn't adding or removing a car or a door. He's just showing us something we didn't know. Yet this act of revealing a goat redistributes the probabilities, concentrating the chances of the car being behind the unchosen door. This subtle shift is deeply unintuitive because it's not how we naturally process randomness or fairness. We want to believe the remaining options are equal because that's what seems simple and fair. For those who can trust the abstraction and focus solely on the math, the solution becomes clear. Switching gives you a 2 in 3 chance of winning, while staying leaves you with only 1 in 3. The math doesn't lie and it provides an undeniable answer. But for those who remain tied to the narrative, where Monty's reveal feels like a random event that resets the game, the solution feels wrong no matter how it's explained. They focus on the story instead of the probabilities, and as a result, the logic never quite clicks. But this paradox is about more than just a game. It's a reflection of how we approach complex problems in everyday life. When faced with uncertainty, we tend to rely on our instincts, which are shaped by experience and intuition. However, in scenarios like this, those instincts can be misleading. The Monty Hall paradox teaches us that the tools of abstraction, simplification and mathematical reasoning are essential for making sense of situations that aren't immediately intuitive. At its core, the paradox underscores the concept of conditional probability, how new information, such as the host revealing a goat, fundamentally reshapes the likelihood of different outcomes. This principle is indispensable in domains like statistics, finance and decision-making processes, where the arrival of new data necessitates a reassessment of prior probabilities. Educators frequently turn to the Monty Hall paradox to illuminate key ideas about probability, decision-making under uncertainty and the critical importance of adapting decisions in light of new information. By confronting and often overturning our intuitive expectations, it encourages critical thinking and analytical skills. The paradox also finds practical relevance in real-world scenarios, such as investigative work, in search and rescue missions, for example, re-evaluating the search area based on emerging clues can dramatically improve the chances of success. This ability to integrate new information and refine strategies reflects the profound value of understanding and applying the lessons of conditional probability. Monty's game is a microcosm of larger challenges we encounter in life, whether it's making decisions based on incomplete information, managing risks or interpreting data, we often face situations where our gut feelings conflict with logic. In these moments, trusting the math or the underlying principles can guide us to better outcomes, even if it doesn't feel right at first. The Monty Hall paradox teaches us that trusting logic over instinct can lead to better outcomes. Whether you're deciding between doors, figuring out life's puzzles, or, you know, Deciding whether to hit that subscribe button, spoiler, subscribing gives you a 2 in 3 chance of never missing a great video, ok maybe it's closer to 100% but who's counting? Thank you for watching this video, let me know your thoughts in the comments, also check out this video where we talked about game theory, I'm sure you'll love it.